Click the link in the description to sign up for a free 30-day trial from audiobooks.com. Adventure 5 of The Return of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Adventure of the Priory School Part 1 We've had some dramatic entrances and exits upon our small stage at Baker Street, but I cannot recollect anything more sudden and startling than the first appearance of Thornycroft Huxtable, M.A., Ph.D., etc. His card, which seemed too small to carry the weight of his academic distinctions, preceded him by a few seconds and then he entered himself so large so pompous and so dignified that he was the very embodiment of self-possession and solidity and yet his first action when the door had closed behind him was to stagger against the table whence he slipped down upon the floor and there was that majestic figure prostrate and insensible upon our bearskin hearth rug we had sprung to our feet and for a few moments we stared in silent amazement at this ponderous piece of wreckage which told of some sudden and fatal storm far out on the ocean of life then holmes hurried with a cushion for his head and i with brandy for his lips the heavy white face was seamed with lines of trouble the hanging pouches under the closed eyes were leaden in colour the loose mouth drooped dolorously at the corners the rolling chins were unshaven collar and shirt bore the grime of a long journey and the hair bristled unkempt from the well-shaped head it was a sorely stricken man who lay before us what is it watson asked holmes absolute exhaustion possibly mere hunger and fatigue said i with my finger on the thready pulse where the stream of life trickled thin and small return ticket from mackleton in the north of england said holmes drawing it from the watch pocket it is not twelve o'clock yet he has certainly been an early starter the puckered eyelids had begun to quiver and now a pair of vacant gray eyes looked up at us an instant later the man had scrambled onto his feet his face crimson with shame forgive this weakness mr holmes i have been a little overwrought thank you if i might have a glass of milk and a biscuit i have no doubt that i should be better i came personally mr holmes in order to ensure that you would return with me i feared that no telegram would convince you of the absolute urgency of the case when you are quite restored i am quite well again i cannot imagine how i came to be so weak i wish you mr holmes to come to mackleton with me by the next train my friend shook his head my colleague dr watson could tell you that we are very busy at present i am retained in this case of the ferrers documents and the abergavenny murder is coming up for trial only a very important issue could call me from london at present important our visitor threw up his hands have you heard nothing of the abduction of the only son of the duke of holderness what the late cabinet minister exactly we had tried to keep it out of the papers but there was some rumor in the globe last night i thought it might have reached your ears holmes shot out his long thin arm and picked out volume h in his encyclopedia of reference holderness six duke k g p c half the alphabet baron beverley earl of carston dear me what a list lord lieutenant of hallamshire since nineteen hundred married edith daughter of sir charles appledore eighteen eighty eight heir and only child lord saltire owns about two hundred and fifty thousand acres minerals in lancashire and wales address carlton house terrace holderness hall Hallamshire, Carston Castle, Bangor, Wales, Lord of the Admiralty, 1872, Chief Secretary of State for. Well, well, this man is certainly one of the greatest subjects of the Crown. The greatest, and perhaps the wealthiest. I am aware, Mr. Holmes, that you take a very high line in professional matters, and that you are prepared to work for the work's sake. I may tell you, however, that his grace has already intimated 
that a cheque for five thousand pounds will be handed over to the person who can tell him where his son is and another thousand to him who can name the man or men who have taken him it is a princely offer said holmes watson i think that we shall accompany dr huxtable back to the north of england and now dr huxtable when you have consumed that milk you will kindly tell me what has happened when it happened how it happened and finally what dr thornycroft huxtable of the priory school near mackleton has to do with the matter and why he comes three days after an event the state of your chin gives the date to ask for my humble services our visitor had consumed his milk and biscuits the light had come back to his eyes and the colour to his cheeks as he set himself with great vigour and lucidity to explain the situation i must inform you gentlemen that the priory is a preparatory school of which i am the founder and principal huxtable's side lights on horace may possibly recall my name to your memories the priory is without exception the best and most select preparatory school in england lord leverstoke the earl of blackwater sir cathcart solmes they all have entrusted their sons to me but i felt that my school had reached its zenith when weeks ago the duke of holderness sent mr james wilder his secretary with intimation that young lord saltire ten years old his only son and heir was about to be committed to my charge little did i think that this would be the prelude to the most crushing misfortune of my life on may first the boy arrived that being the beginning of the summer term he was a charming youth and he soon fell into our ways i may tell you i trust that i am not indiscreet but half confidence are absurd in such a case that he was not entirely happy at home it is an open secret that the duke's married life had not been a peaceful one and the matter had ended in a separation by mutual consent the duchess taking up her residence in the south of france this had occurred very shortly before and the boy's sympathies are known to have been strongly with his mother he moped after her departure from holderness hall and it was for this reason that the duke desired to send him to my establishment in a fortnight the boy was quite at home with us and was apparently absolutely happy he was last seen on the night of may thirteenth that is the night of last monday his room was on the second floor and was approached through another large room in which two boys were sleeping these boys saw and heard nothing so that it is certain that young saltair did not pass out that way his window was open and there is a stout ivy plant leading to the ground we could trace no footmarks below but it is sure that this is the only possible exit his absence was discovered at seven o'clock on tuesday morning his bed had been slept in he had dressed himself fully before going off in his usual school suit of black eton jacket and dark grey trousers there were no signs of that anyone had entered the room and it is quite certain that anything in the nature of cries or a struggle would have been heard since Caunter, the elder boy in the inner room is a very light sleeper when lord saltier's disappearance was discovered i at once called a roll of the whole establishment boys masters and servants it was then that we ascertained that lord saltier had not been alone in his flight heidegger the german master was missing his room was on the second floor at the farther end of the building facing the same way as lord saltier's his bed had also been slept in but he had apparently gone away partly dressed since his shirt and socks were lying on the floor he had undoubtedly let himself down by the ivy for we could see the marks of his feet where he had landed on the lawn his bicycle was kept in a small shed beside his lawn and it also was gone he had been with me for two years and came with the best references but he was a silent morose man not very popular either with masters or boys 
no trace could be found of the fugitives and now on thursday morning we are as ignorant as we were on tuesday inquiry was of course made at once at holderness hall which is only a few miles away and we imagine that in some sudden attack of homesickness he had gone back to his father but nothing had been heard of him the duke is greatly agitated and as to me you have seen yourselves the state of nervous prostration to which the suspense and the responsibility have reduced me mr holmes if ever you put forward your full powers i implore you to do so now for never in your life could you have a case which is more worthy of them sherlock holmes had listened with the utmost intentness to the statement of the unhappy schoolmaster his drawn brows and the deep furrow between them showed that he needed no exhortation to concentrate all his attention upon a problem which apart from the tremendous interests involved must appeal so directly to his love of the complex and the unusual he now drew out his notebook and jotted down one or two memoranda you have been very remiss in not coming to me sooner said he severely you start me on my investigation with a very serious handicap it is conceivable for example that this ivy and this lawn would have yielded nothing to an expert observer i am not to blame mr holmes his grace was extremely desirous to avoid all public scandal he was afraid of his family unhappiness being dragged before the world he has a deep horror of anything of the kind but there has been some official investigation yes sir and it has proved most disappointing an apparent clue was at once obtained since a boy and a young man were reported to have been seen leaving a neighboring station by an early train only last night we had news that the couple had been hunted down in liverpool and they proved to have no connection whatever with the matter in hand then it was that in my despair and disappointment after a sleepless night i came straight to you by the early train i suppose the local investigation was relaxed while this false clue was being followed up it was entirely dropped so that three days have been wasted the affair has been most deplorably handled i feel it and admit it and yet the problem should be capable of ultimate solution i shall be very happy to look into it have you been able to trace any connection between the missing boy and his german master none at all was he in the master's class no he never exchanged a word with him so far as i know that is certainly very singular had the boy a bicycle no was any other bicycle missing no is that certain quite well now you do not mean to seriously suggest that this german rode off upon a bicycle in the dead of the night bearing the boy in his arms certainly not then what is the theory in your mind the bicycle may have been a blind it may have been hidden somewhere and the pair gone off on foot quite so but it seems rather an absurd blind does it not were there other bicycles in this shed uh, several would he not have hidden a couple had he desired to give the idea that they had gone off upon them i suppose he would of course he would the blind theory won't do but the incident is an admirable starting point for an investigation after all a bicycle is not an easy thing to conceal or to destroy one other question did anyone call to see the boy on the day before he disappeared no did he get any letters yes one letter from whom from his father do you open the boy's letters no how do you know it was from the father the coat of arms was on the envelope and it was addressed in the duke's peculiarly stiff hand besides the duke remembers having written when had he a letter before that not for several days 
had he ever won from france no oh, never you see the point of my questions of course either the boy was carried off by force or he went of his own free will in the latter case you would expect that some prompting from outside would be needed to make so young a lad do such a thing if he has had no visitors that prompting must have come in letters hence i try to find out who were his correspondents i fear i cannot help you much his only correspondent so far as i know was his own father who wrote to him on the very day of his disappearance were the relations between father and son very friendly his grace is never very friendly with anyone he is completely immersed in large public questions and is rather inaccessible to all ordinary emotions but he was always kind to the boy in his own way but the sympathies of the latter were with the mother yes did he say so no the duke then good heaven no then how could you know i have had some confidential talks with mr james wilder his grace's secretary it was he who gave me the information about lord saltire's feelings i see by the way that last letter of the duke's or was it found in the boy's room after he was gone no uh, he had taken it with him i think mr holmes it is time that we were leaving for euston i will order a four-wheeler in a quarter of an hour we shall be at your service if you are telegraphing home mr huxtable it would be well to allow the people in your neighborhood to imagine that the inquiry is still going on in liverpool or wherever else that red herring led your pack in the meantime i will do a little quiet work at your own doors and perhaps the scent is not so cold but that two old hounds like watson and myself may get a sniff of it that evening found us in the cold bracing atmosphere of the peak country in which dr huxtable's famous school is situated it was already dark when we reached it a card was lying on the hall table and the butler whispered something to his master who turned to us with agitation in every heavy feature the duke is here said he the duke and mr wilder are in the study come gentlemen and i will introduce you i was of course familiar with the pictures of the famous statesman but the man himself was very different from his representation he was a tall and stately person scrupulously dressed with a drawn thin face and a nose which was grotesquely curved and long his complexion was of a dead pallor which was more startling by contrast with a long dwindling beard of vivid red which flowed down over his white waistcoat with his watch chain gleaming through its fringe such was the stately presence who looked stonily at us from the centre of dr huxtable's hearth rug beside him stood a very young man whom i understood to be wilder the private secretary he was small nervous alert with intelligent light blue eyes and mobile features it was he who at once in an incisive and positive tone opened the conversation i called this morning dr huxtable too late to prevent you from starting to london i learned that your object was to invite mr sherlock holmes to undertake the conduct of this case his grace is surprised dr huxtable that you should have taken such a step without consulting him when i learned that the police had failed his grace is by no means convinced that the police have failed but surely mr wilder you are well aware dr huxtable that his grace is particularly anxious to avoid all public scandal he prefers to take as few people as possible into his confidence the matter can be easily remedied said the browbeaten doctor mr sherlock holmes can return to london by the morning train hardly that doctor hardly that said holmes in his blandest voice this northern air is invigorating and pleasant so i propose to spend a few days upon your moors and to occupy my mind as best i may whether i have the shelter of your roof or the village inn is of course for you to decide 
i could see that the unfortunate doctor was in the last stage of indecision from which he was rescued by the deep sonorous voice of the red-bearded duke which boomed out like a dinner gong i agree with mr wilder dr huxtable that you have done wisely to consult me but since mr holmes has already been taken into your confidence it would indeed be absurd that we should not avail ourselves of his services far from going to the inn mr holmes i should be pleased if you would come and stay with me at holderness hall i thank your grace for the purposes of my investigation i think that it would be wiser for me to remain at the scene of the mystery just as you like mr holmes any information which mr wilder or i can give you is of course at your disposal it will probably be necessary for me to see you at the hall said holmes i would only ask you now sir whether you have formed any explanation in your own mind as to the mysterious disappearance of your son no sir i have not excuse me if i allude to that which is painful to you but i have no alternative do you think that the duchess had anything to do with the matter the great minister showed perceptible hesitation i do not think so he said at last the other most obvious explanation is that the child has been kidnapped for the purpose of levying ransom you have not had any demand of the sort no sir one more question your grace i understand that you wrote to your son upon the day when this incident occurred no i wrote upon the day before exactly but he received it on that day yes was there anything in your letter which might have unbalanced him or induced him to take such a step no sir certainly not did you post that letter yourself the nobleman's reply was interrupted by his secretary who broke in with some heat his grace is not in the habit of posting letters himself said he this letter was laid with others upon the study table and i myself put them in the post bag you are sure this one was among them yes i observed it how many letters did your grace write that day twenty or thirty i have a large correspondence but surely this is somewhat irrelevant not entirely said holmes for my own part the duke continued i have advised the police to turn their attention to the south of france i have already said that i do not believe that the duchess would encourage so monstrous an action but the lad had the most wrong-headed opinions and it is possible that he may have fled to her aided and abetted by this german i think dr huxtable that we will now return to the hall i could see that there were other questions which holmes would have wished to put but the nobleman's abrupt manner showed that the interview was at an end it was evident that to his intensely aristocratic nature this discussion of his intimate family affairs with a stranger was most abhorrent and that he feared lest every fresh question would throw a fiercer light into the discreetly shadowed corners of his ducal history when the nobleman and his secretary had left my friend flung himself at once with characteristic eagerness into the investigation the boy's chamber was carefully examined and yielded nothing save the absolute conviction that it was only through the window that he could have escaped the german master's room and effects gave no further clue in his case a trailer of ivy had given way under his weight and we saw by the light of a lantern the mark on the lawn where his heels had come down that one dint in the short green grass was the only material witness left of this inexplicable nocturnal flight sherlock holmes left the house alone and only returned after eleven he had obtained a large ordnance map of the neighborhood and this he brought into my room where he laid it out on the bed and having balanced a lamp in the middle of it he began to smoke over it and occasionally to point out objects of interest with the reeking amber of his pipe holmes map of the neighborhood of the school 
this case grows upon me watson said he there are decidedly some points of interest in connection with it in this early stage i want you to realize those geographical features which may have a good deal to do with our investigation look at this map this dark square is the priory school i'll put a pin in it now this line is the main road you see that it runs east and west past the school and you see also that there is no side road for a mile either way if these two folk passed away by road it was this road exactly by a singular and happy chance we are able to some extent to check what passed along this road during the night in question at this point where my pipe is now resting a county constable was on duty from twelve to six it is as you perceive the first crossroad on the east side this man declares that he was not absent from his post for an instant and he is positive that neither boy nor man could have gone that way unseen i have spoken with this policeman to-night and he appears to me to be a perfectly reliable person that blocks this end we have now to deal with the other there is an inn here the red bull the landlady of which was ill she had sent to mackleton for a doctor but he did not arrive until morning being absent at another case the people at the inn were alert all night awaiting his coming and one or other of them seems to have continually had an eye upon the road they declare that no one passed if their evidence is good then we are fortunate enough to be able to block the west and also to be able to say that the fugitives did not use the road at all but the bicycle i objected quite so we will come to the bicycle presently to continue our reasoning if these people did not go by the road they must have traversed the country to the north of the house or to the south of the house that is certain let us weigh the one against the other on the south of the house is as you perceive a large district of arable land cut up into small fields with stone walls between them there i admit that a bicycle is impossible we can dismiss the idea we turn to the country on the north here there lies a grove of trees marked as the ragged shore and on the farther side stretches a great rolling moor lower gill moor extending for ten miles and sloping gradually upward here at one side of this wilderness is holderness hall ten miles by road but only six across the moor it is a peculiarly desolate plain a few more farmers of small holdings where they rear sheep and cattle except these the plover and the curlew are the only inhabitants until you come to the chesterfield high road there is a church there you see a few cottages and an inn beyond that the hills become precipitous surely it is here to the north that our quest must lie but the bicycle i persisted well well said holmes impatiently a good cyclist does not need a high road the moor is intersected with paths and the moon was at the full hello what's this there was an agitated knock at the door and an instant afterwards dr huxtable was in the room in his hand he held a blue cricket cap with a white chevron on the peak at last we have a clue he cried thank heaven at last we are on the dear boy's track it is his cap where was it found in the van of the gypsies who camped on the moor they left on tuesday today the police traced them down and examined their caravan this was found how do they account for it they shuffled and lied said that they found it on the moor on tuesday morning they know where he is the rascals thank goodness they're all safe under lock and key either the fear of the law or the duke's purse will certainly get out of them all that they know so far so good said holmes when the doctor had at last left the room it at least bears out the theory that it is on the side of the lower gill moor that we must hope for results the police have really done nothing locally save the arrest of those gypsies look here watson 
there's a water course across the moor you see it marked here in the map in some parts it widens into a morass this is particularly so in the region between holderness hall and the school it is vain to look elsewhere for tracks in this dry weather but at that point there is certainly a chance of some record being left i will call you early tomorrow morning and you and i will try if we can throw some light upon the mystery the day was just breaking when i woke to find the long thin form of holmes by my bedside he was fully dressed and had apparently already been out i have done the lawn and the bicycle shed said he i have also had a rumble through the ragged shore now watson there is cocoa ready in the next room i must beg you to hurry for we have a great day before us his eyes shone and his cheek was flushed with the exhilaration of the master workman who sees his work lie ready before him a very different holmes this active alert man from the introspective and pallid dreamer of baker street i felt as i looked upon that supple figure alive with nervous energy that it was indeed a strenuous day that awaited us and yet it opened in the blackest disappointment with high hopes we struck across the peaty russet moor intersected with a thousand sheep paths until we came to the broad light green belt which marked the morass between us and holderness certainly if the lad had gone homeward he must have passed this and he could not pass it without leaving his traces but no sign of him or the german could be seen with a darkening face my friend strode along the margin eagerly observant of every muddy stain upon the mossy surface sheep marks there were in profusion and at one place some miles down cows had left their tracks nothing more check number one said holmes looking gloomily over the rolling expanse of the moor there is another morass down yonder and a narrow neck between hello 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 what have we here we had come on a small black ribbon of pathway in the middle of it clearly marked on the sodden soil was the track of a bicycle hurrah i cried we have it but holmes was shaking his head and his face was puzzled and expectant rather than joyous a bicycle certainly but not the bicycle said he i am familiar with forty-two different impressions left by tires this as you perceive is a dunlop with a patch upon the outer cover heidegger's tires were palmers leaving longitudinal stripes aveling the mathematical master was sure upon the point therefore it is not heidegger's track the boys then possibly if we could prove a bicycle to have been in his possession but this we have utterly failed to do this track as you perceive was made by a rider who was going from the direction of the school or towards it no no my dear watson the more deeply sunk impression is of course the hind wheel upon which the weight rests you perceive several places where it has passed across and obliterated the more shallow mark of the front one it was undoubtedly heading away from the school it may or may not be connected with our inquiry but we will follow it backwards before we get any further we did so and at the end of a few hundred yards lost the tracks as we emerged from the boggy portion of the moor following the path backwards we picked out another spot where a spring trickled across it here once again was the mark of the bicycle though nearly obliterated by the hoofs of cows after that there was no sign but the path ran right on into ragged shore the wood which backed on to the school from this wood the cycle must have emerged holmes sat down on a boulder and rested his chin in his hands i had smoked two cigarettes before he moved well well said he at last it is of course possible that a cunning man might change the tires of his bicycle in order to leave the unfamiliar tracks a criminal who was capable of such a thought is a man whom i should be proud to do business with we will leave this question undecided and hark back to our morass again for we have left a good deal unexplored 
we continued our systematic survey of the edge of the sodden portion of the moor and soon our perseverance was gloriously rewarded right across the lower part of the bog lay a miry path holmes gave a cry of delight as he approached it an impression like a fine bundle of telegraph wires ran down the centre of it it was the palmer tyres here is herr heidegger sure enough cried holmes exultantly my reasoning seems to have been pretty sound watson i congratulate you but we have a long way still to go kindly walk clear of the path now let us follow the trail i fear that it will not lead very far we found however as we advanced that this portion of the moor is intersected with soft patches and though we frequently lost sight of the track we always succeeded in picking it up once more do you observe said holmes that the rider is now undoubtedly forcing the pace there can be no doubt of it look at this impression where you get both tires clear the one is as deep as the other that can only mean that the rider is throwing his weight onto the handlebar as a man does when he is sprinting by jove he's had a fall there was a broad irregular smudge covering some yards of the track then there were a few footmarks and the tire reappeared once more a side slip i suggested holmes held up a crumpled branch of flowering gorse to my horror i perceived that the yellow blossoms were all dabbed with crimson on the path too and among the heather were dark stains of clotted blood bad said holmes bad stand clear watson not an unnecessary footstep what do i read here he fell wounded he stood up he remounted he proceeded but there is no other track cattle on this side path he was surely not gored by a bull impossible but i see no traces of anyone else we must push on watson surely with stains as well as the track to guide us he cannot escape us now our search was not a very long one the tracks of the tire began to curve fantastically upon the wet and shining path suddenly as i looked ahead the gleam of metal caught my eye from amid the thick gorse bushes out of them we dragged a bicycle palmer tired one pedal bent and the whole front of it horribly smeared and slobbered with blood on the other side of the bushes a shoe was projecting we ran round and there lay the unfortunate rider he was a tall man full bearded with spectacles one glass of which had been knocked out the cause of his death was a frightful blow upon the head which had crushed in part of his skull that he could have gone on after receiving such an injury said much for the vitality and courage of the man he wore shoes but no socks and his open coat disclosed a nightshirt beneath it it was undoubtedly the german master holmes turned the body over reverently and examined it with great attention he then sat in deep thought for a time and i could see by his ruffled brow that this grim discovery had not in his opinion advanced as much in our inquiry it is a little difficult to know what to do watson said he at last my own inclinations are to push this inquiry on for we have already lost so much time that we cannot afford to waste another hour on the other hand we are bound to inform the police of the discovery and to see that this poor fellow's body is looked after i could take a note back but i need your company and assistance wait a bit there is a fellow cutting peat up yonder bring him over here and he will guide the police end of part one of the adventure of the priory school greatest audiobooks is excited to partner with audiobooks.com sign up for a free 30-day trial and get your first audiobook free cancel any time no strings attached click below to get your free audiobook today